Welcome to this sample audio clip, which comes from this series entitled Multi-Hall Conversations with Jim Brown. In this segment, Jim speaks to longtime sailor, survival expert, author, and speaker, Stephen Callahan. Among the topics Jim discussed with Steve are how Steve got into sailing and a sailing trip that he took with Jim's son, Russell, to the island of Tahiti aboard Russell's Proa, which is named Jazeera. But in this portion of the audio, Steve speaks to the experience of surviving at sea after disaster strikes. To find out more about this historic multi-hall audio series, come visit us on the web at www.outrigmedia.com. But, you, you know, that basically, you know, what we do when we go to sea is we, we go off with whatever we've got. We've got to solve these problems, whether the rudder falls off, or the mast falls down, or, you know, the stuff that happens out there. And so I was, I had had a fair amount of experience with all, with, with doing that. And in fact, I had found doing races, for example, that um, if we had run into some problem, especially if it was a significant problem, and somehow figured out a good solution to that problem and gotten ourselves home, that that was much more satisfying than like winning or or something like that. I always I always enjoyed that that element of things of making do. Well, and when I was a kid, you know, I always I loved the stories of the mountain men, you know, who would go out into the wilderness and somehow make do on their own. And I think that's what always appealed to me about going to sea. I've always loved wilderness environments, and boats are a, just this fabulous tool that gets us into this wilderness environment uh, where we can see this incredible world where the wildlife is all different and where, I don't know, human issues shrink into insignificance, really. Uh, and we can be a part of this grandeur of of the greater uh, universe out there. I mean, to me, it's a spiritual thing. And when I left on my little boat from the United States, I got to Bermuda and, you know, I have lots and lots of friends and family who have nothing to do with sailing, don't really know anything about it. And they were all going like, well, why would you do this? And I kept asking myself that, you know, why do it? And, and so I sat down and I wrote a, I wrote a letter to them from Bermuda, you know, and it, I guess the bottom line was that, you know, I said, you know, some people go to church. I go to sea. I feel spiritually uplifted out there. And um, being completely humbled by the environment is a really big part of that. So it's not a matter of controlling the environment, but trying to work with it and survive with it. And, you know, it doesn't matter what kind of boat you have, really. It's just a tool to get out there. But um, some tools are better than others. And I guess, I guess when I was, you know, when I was really young, um, I was reading a lot of uh, books about, like, raft voyages, you know, Contiki and that sort of thing. And, you know, that really appealed to me. Uh, wasn't so much the getting there, but the being there. And I guess I got that in, you know, be careful what you wish for, because in 1982, I guess I got that, that wish fulfilled. <laughs> maybe it is a wish, Steve. You know, may, maybe the reason we, we put ourselves out there is in order to, to find out if we can function under such different circumstances, different pressures. That yeah. must be. That must explain at least part of it, you know. Uh, well, being able yeah, to I, see think, the I think I think so. Of your own decisions. <clears throat> yeah, um, yeah. I don't. I don't know what it is, really, Jim. But you know, like I said I just feel. I feel at home. I, you know, ever since I first went sailing off the coast of Massachusetts, and you know, land fell away, and you're just out there with the water. And I remember laying in the bottom of this. We had uh, the guy who taught me how to sail had a um, little old day day sailor at the time. And I was like laying down in the, in, on the floorboards, and the boat was heeled over, and I could see the edge, you know, see the horizon of the water, and kind of being on its level, and 
just feeling at home there. Um, it just all felt natural and right to me. And I don't know, I, we can cogitate about it all and everything, but uh, once you start disappearing down this sailing vortex, I guess there's no crawling out of it, and you can rationalize it any way you want. But in the in the end, it's just something in our bones. Yeah, my gosh, uh, Steve, uh, I, I must come back to the uh, to the inventiveness that. Uh, that the, you managed to achieve uh, with that raft. I mean, uh, the thing that that stayed with me is that, that business of your fashioning that plug, that grooved plug that you could poke into the hole in the raft and pull the fabric up and lash around the fabric in the groove in order to keep the thing afloat. I mean, that that's a patch, you know, <laughs> and that's that's inventiveness. That's a that's a real mechanic that uh, you you had to perform as out there. Well, I wish it had taken me a lot less time <laughs> than it did. It took me a long time to figure out something. Actually, what happened is in in the the the, the real secret to that solution was ramming a pin down through the through the material and through the plug, because every time I had, I had uh, inflated the raft. I'd stuck the plug in and lashed it all up. You know, as the material stretched out tight again, the whole thing would just all fall apart. Uh, and uh, what I really needed was a pin driven down through there that gave me something secure to lash to that couldn't possibly be forced out of the uh, uh, out of the patch. And uh, it took me like over a week to figure that out. I mean, it always reminded me that you know, no matter how smart we think we are. Um, we're not all that brilliant, and, and a perfect example of that was um, I had complained even in the book um, about uh, the Dorado that had um, basically built up the, a school around the raft, and you know they would become my companions, almost kill me, and bring my salvation. In the end, um, they're really the central. Um, character in a drift, as far as I'm concerned, um, because they really symbolize the magic and the mystery of the sea and uh, and all of that. And but they they proved that they were incredibly smart very early on. And I kept trying to spear them with a spear gun, and within about 24 hours, they learned just just what the range of the spear gun was, and so they'd skirt around just outside that range and. Uh, I, I tried to catch them with a line, uh, and they just bit through the line. And then I found a piece of wire on a on a radar reflector and put that on the end of the line and hooked one. And it just swam really fast forward in and uh, snapped the line off just in front of the leader. So I was complaining in the book about this, like, oh my God, you know, I just don't. I'm never going to catch one of these things by a line. And then. Years later, I was doing a radio interview and uh, with, um, I think it was called Kids America or something like that, and this uh, roughly 10-year-old boy came on the uh, radio and he says, well, look, you know, I read your book and um, you complained that you didn't have any wire um, left in the raft to make another leader, and I said, yeah, and he goes, well... You know, it, early in the book, you described that there's a light on the top of the raft, um, and I said, yeah, and he goes, well, you also said that that was uh, powered by a battery that was down in the water, and I said, yeah, and he goes, well, wasn't there a piece of wire, like, running from that light down to the the battery in the water, and you know, Jim, this was years after the experience in, in publication of the book and everything, and this was the first person of any age to to figure that out and i'm sitting there going <laughs> you know yeah. how stupid could i have been not to have realized that at the time so it wasn't like i was being brilliant i just did the best i could and i knew i made mistakes and and whatnot and there would be a lot of times where i was wishing for somebody to be with me who uh, could you know bounce ideas off of or come up with another slant on um, on uh, what might be a solution to the problem. So I was lucky in a lot of ways, Jim. Um, it wasn't that I was being all that brilliant, but I was also, I guess, uh, determined enough that I just keep plugging away at stuff. I'm very, very stubborn, and uh, and so I just keep plugging away at stuff, and eventually something works, hopefully. Well, gee, uh, <clears throat> uh, Steve, uh, the... The next 
thing that comes to mind after hearing a story like that is, uh, <laughs> do you mean that guy went back out into the ocean again? <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, well, why do we keep doing this? <laughs> oh, I don't know, because we do. I mean, you know, if you talk to, I've interviewed lots and lots of survivors over the years of all kinds of things, and it's very rare for people not to go back and do what they were doing before. Uh, um, I don't know what I would do other than messing around with boats. It's what I've always done, and um, you can, you know, you can't control what happens to you. You can only have some sense of control over how you perceive it and what you do with it. And uh, you know, life is full of challenges, as you well know, and um, we can't get rid of those. Uh, and we can look at those as devastating or we can look at them as opportunities. And for me, I guess I would not want to have that happen again to me. It was kind of a living hell in a lot of ways. Physically, it was incredibly difficult. Um, but at the same time, it delivered to me um, – just incredible numbers of gifts um, from the relationship I felt with fish to scenes I could only have witnessed had I been there. Um, uh, just uh, things of natural beauty um, that I, I, I would never have seen had I been skittering across the ocean or been in another set of circumstances to coming back and being given a chance to kind of reinvent my life to uh, – fix a lot of kind of personal problems that or at least half repair all the the personal problems that I had when I I left and and went to sea and opportunities to write to meet incredible new people from the survivors I've met over the years to people in all walks of life um that I would not have met had this not happened to me um I've learned a huge amount from it 